I think it's safe to say that Terry is one of the world's leading digital disruptors. Today, he'll be speaking on how the pandemic has forced disruption in your business and what's next. Terry, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Brian. And it's great to be with you all virtually. Uh, this way, I get to wear shorts. So <laughs> let's get started. Digital transformation, one of the most important corporate initiatives pre-COVID. But now it's digital disruption because every company is racing to be digital to keep up with the changes that COVID has required. Leaders are worried. They're worried because they've seen disruption in so many businesses from music to payments. And today things are moving faster. How much faster? Well, think of it this way. The telephone took 75 years to reach 50 million users. Pokemon Go did it in 15 days. 75 years to 15 days, that's the pace of business today. And now of course, we're in the biggest business and social disruption of our lives. And digital disruption isn't slowing during this period, it's actually accelerating. So it's critical to understand that selling and shopping and making have changed forever because of this pandemic. Now recently I interviewed Jesus Mantis. He runs strategy for a $63 billion IBM division. Let's listen to what he had to say about digital disruption. Surveys are showing that digital transformation is not slowing after COVID-19. In fact, it's accelerating. What are you seeing with IBM customers? And now is beyond adaptation, is how do we emerge stronger from this opportunity? And as you said, everybody is actually looking at um, what are the things that we can accelerate? Um, before, digitizing things was an option for more competitive advantage. In some of these industries, it's becoming the only way you can survive. Now it's about survival. Think about one technological disruption self-driving cars. Certainly it's gonna disrupt truck drivers, the number one employment for high school educated males in the United States, but what about insurance? Moving from actuarial to actual data. What about parking? You're not gonna park anymore, you're gonna send your car home and call it back when you need it. Auto repair, if your car is electric, there's not much to do. Real estate, redesigned. Deliveries, reimagined. Hotels, well, honey, let's just sleep in the car. We're almost to Vegas. Healthcare, the number three reason for emergency room visits is car wrecks. They're gonna go down dramatically. Hospitals are being redesigned. Billboards, a multi-billion dollar business. Who's gonna be looking out the window? And even traffic cops, who are you gonna arrest? Elon? All these businesses disrupted just by one new technology. So I wanna to talk today about nine forces of disruption, nine technological forces that are changing business forever. Now, if you're King Kong in your market, you can use these technologies to fight the Godzilla, the other big guy. And if you're a startup, then you're, they are your slingshot to bring, bring down Godzilla. So let's talk first about connectivity because you know, when we started with the internet, the first page of Travelocity looked like this and the first page of Yahoo like this. What's missing? Search. And you remember this, it was slow. It was really, really slow. And yet that limited connectivity equaled great opportunity. An opportunity that disrupted music that went from the album to buy the song, maps that went to digital and free, books that went to digital and cheap, encyclopedias that went to digital and cheap and free. And then we got a little bit of more speed and we got a two way internet and user generated content. And then hotels went to sharing and photography went to free and sharing and limos went to sharing and cheap and news went to sharing and free and software went to free and ad based, more disruption. Now during COVID, e-commerce sales are up 50%. 
And surveys show people aren't going back. And not all of them are going back to the office either because another survey shows that many will stay at home even after a vaccine. How about mobility? Another big disruptor. Seven billion cell phones in the world, five billion of them network connected. Half of Priceline's business is mobile. In my business, if you're not mobile, you're not in business. And oh yeah, then there's the other $50 billion disruptor, the App Store. We're about to get even more speed in mobile with 5G. 5G, allowing for smart cities, broadband to be beamed to your home, 5G remote surgery, 5G for internet of things. So if 1200 baud modems disrupted all these businesses, what's 5G gonna do at 20 gigs? I think we're underselling it. I think we don't know. I think it's gonna change business again, dramatically. Now, during COVID, we've seen all kinds of mobile applications. How about the Amazon Go store? With no clerks and contactless checkout, it looked a little odd a year ago. Now it looks like they had a crystal ball. Then there's big data. Big data is really big. Two and a half quintillion bytes a day. Where to put it? Well, along came the cloud. Why is the cloud important? Because it's instantly available, infinitely scalable, insanely inexpensive, and drop dead easy. That makes it a game changer. It's why two guys in the startup have the computing power of a Fortune 500 company. That dramatically tilts the playing field. And it's also about instant learning from your customers. John Deere no longer has to learn what the dealers think the farmer does with the tractor. Because they're always connected to the cloud, they know what the farmer's doing with the tractor and they can change it with a software update. Now, how about AI? AI is affecting all kinds of technologies. AI is the new UI. It's the new user interface. Voice, the most important AI change. Listen to this guy. Alexa, order toilet paper. Amazon's choice for toilet paper is Angel soft bath tissue. That's cool. Yes, that's cool. But it's also disruptive, why? Because if I go to Amazon to buy toilet paper, I see 10 different brands above the fold. How many did Alexa offer? Only one. What's it gonna cost to be the one? You think search is expensive? As we move from e-commerce to v-commerce, another disruptive change. And by the way, 35% more people are ordering through smart speakers during COVID. Now, if you add AI to the technologies we've already talked about, you get a superpower for the technologies that are next. So how about IoT, the Internet of Things? 75 billion things to be connected to the Internet by 2025. Honeywell has put sensors in buildings for years. You had to look at the little red light to figure out what was going on. But then they moved from sensing to meaning. Compressor failure, turn off AC in section one. And then they moved from meaning to action. Back up on service dispatch, from sensing to meaning to action. That's an outcome. That's a new and much more profitable business model using IoT. Now, during COVID, we've seen things like thermometers that not only take baby's temperature, but if it's serious, can connect you directly to the doctor and report on COVID cases all over the country and sensors that allow you to change something in the field without sending out a technician, which could be dangerous today. How about robots? Robots have been in business for years. These are the Tesla robots. But now we have first responder robots or this concierge robot that my AI company built. During COVID, we're seeing robots that are spraying to reduce the disease. We're seeing the one on the bottom here, the germinator that's, that beams UV in a hospital room. We're seeing airport cleaning robots. And down below, a stockout robot. Walmart has bought 10,000 to run at night to make sure they have the stock that they want at any particular moment. How about 3D printing, additive manufacturing? We're printing parts, we're printing cars, we're printing medical devices, we're printing whole houses. Did you know that 90% of hearing aids are 3D printed? That change happened in only four years. 
four years, the companies that didn't make the change, they're gone. Now, GE just got the first airline part 3D printed, approved by the FAA. It's a jet fuel nozzle. Think about how it was made before. A bunch of little companies in China each made their little piece and sent it to an assembler who put it together and he stuck it in a warehouse and when the order came in, it went on a ship and a truck to GE. Now add one 3D printer. That whole supply chain is gone. GE gets a part that's cheaper, lighter, stronger, faster, no inventory. And how about all those people from the truck driver to the customs broker who participated in the old way of doing business? They're gone. They're not needed. Isn't it better to be the disruptor? Maybe have your own 3D printing factory? So we've talked about nine forces of disruption. We could talk about 90 more. Look folks, if you don't like change, you're gonna like irrelevance even less. We have to change. And in the 21st century, we have to own the edge. Now you see the edge used to be having your store at first and main, but the edge has moved. The edge today is the edge of the glass because that's where we live and that's where we order. Or it's the entertainment system in your car that says, hey, you're about out of gas and there's a shell station up here two blocks and we'll give you free coffee if you come in and fill up right now. Or it's my Brita that orders its own filters. Or it's my furnace filter that orders its own replacement. That's owning the edge. That's driving new business models like OPA other people's assets. So Uber looked at the limo business and said, we don't wanna own cars, licensed cars, and service cars. Drivers can find us. We're just gonna do these four things, add some amazing software, and become the biggest limo company on earth, changing the business model. When I left Travelocity and founded Kayak, we said, well, we don't wanna do this, and we don't wanna do that. We'll just create a brand, search for products, and book a ticket. Then we said, well, let's not create a brand, let's use Google. Let's not book a ticket, let's send the customer to the airline. We only did one thing, just one thing, added some amazing software and created a company that's just a thin layer between the customer and the supplier, worth $1.8 billion. That's owning the edge. How about O&O, &O, over and over, subscriptions, or D2C, direct to consumer, well, subscriptions probably started with Book of the Month Club, but who would have thought of subscribing to Razors? Dollar Shave Club sold to Gillette for $1.8 billion. How about direct to consumer? Warby Parker, $1.75 billion. Away, $1.4 billion. Changing a business model can be highly lucrative. How about people who disrupt the experience of buying or using a product? Think about how Apple disrupted Nokia, how Spotify disrupted Apple, how Uber disrupted Yellow Cabs, how Gillette was disrupted by Dollar Shave Club, just because they changed how we buy or we use a product, another very profitable disruption strategy. It's all about less capital and more speed. Less capital and more speed, but you might say, we have the supply chain, the brand, the people, the assets, yeah but maybe you're not easy. And these companies are drop dead easy. We have a slogan in Silicon Valley, step one, install software. There is no step two. That's how easy Uber is. Are you that easy? So what's your new model? Last year, I spoke to the Hartford Steam Boiler Insurance Company. They've been insuring boilers in factories since 1866. I said, what's new? They said, oh, we just got into cyber insurance and we bought an internet of things company. Wow, they're playing to their strengths. They know industrial processes, they know inspection, they know how to measure risk and they're comfortable with it. They're gonna be a 200 year old company using new technology to move forward. So what's the new edge? Are you gonna be the winner in contactless shopping, the leader in telemedicine, drive robotic delivery? How are you gonna change? There's more change ahead, folks. What's holding you back from being a disruptor yourself? What's holding you back? 50% of executives are dissatisfied with the state of innovation in their company. Look, I'd encourage them to check the mirror. 
Maybe it's their attitude toward risk. Do they avoid it, reduce it, transfer it, or accept it? In the 21st century, you have to accept more risk. Now, I started my career as a receptionist in a travel agency almost 50 years ago. Six months in, my manager said, let's go do a startup. And you might think that was a big risk, but really, it was a small risk. I was single, I was 21, I wasn't making much money anyway. And we turned it into the 50th largest travel company in the US. Later, I went to American Airlines, climbed the ladder to become CIO. When I was CIO, it took a huge risk. I was married, I had two kids, a big salary, a big mortgage. I said, you know that little online thing we have? I wanna go run that. Everybody thought I was crazy. But we turned it into Travelocity and took it public for $1.2 billion. Big risk, big reward. Now, recently I've taken a lot of small risks. I'm a speaker, an author. I've been on 17 public and private boards. I look back at those companies, some of them shrank, some of them blew up entirely. And the rest of them created $6 billion worth of value. And two of them are internet unicorns, billion dollar startups. Risk, reward. Take the first risk. And check the mirror again. Because are you agile enough for today's economy? I interviewed recently Bill Connor, runs a company Sonic Wall, which is one of the largest security companies. Let's know what he has to say. Bill, security companies have been at the center of the COVID force transition to work from home. I understand one of your companies asked you to transition 350,000 employees to work from home securely almost overnight. When that CIO called and said, Bill, you gotta help us, we gotta move this in, you know, in less than two weeks. We gotta, and, and fortunately, our technology was built that it could scale globally on that kind of basis. And within a week, we turned up uh, almost 350,000 of their employees for this, what we call the new business. That's the new normal. You also have to make decisions faster because in corporate America, you launch your idea out there. Marketing says, that's a dumb idea. IT said, we couldn't write that software. If you get through them, well, and service says they can't fix it and manufacturing says they can't build it. And if you manage to get through them, they bring out the big guns because it's time now for finance and legal and well, it's just game over. But if you come together, you have more strength than any startup. You just have to stop saying no and realize your job now is to get that new idea over the finish line. To be competitive, you have to create ideas as fast as any startup, and that means saying yes. So fail again, fail better. Failure opens the door to success. Maybe you're just chained to an old model. Someone comes in with a new idea, do you say, well, Barbara, we've always done it this way, and we've actually never done it that way. What happens when you say that? The air goes out of the room. You'll never get a new idea from her again. What is dangerous is not to evolve. We have to evolve. We have to face our fears. Established businesses view disruption as a threat. Disruption, innovation, disruption. They're just two sides of the same coin. You only call it a disruption because you didn't do it. If you did it, it would be an innovation. So their innovation can be your disruption but you can act, so stop being disrupted and innovate. Don't just recreate, reimagine what the future can be. Will you be the leader in drone delivery, the innovator in contactless shopping, use robots to revolutionize your sector, reshape your industry for the new normal? Folks, change, change is inevitable, but growth, growth is optional. Growth is up to you. Thanks very much, and I think I'm hearing virtual applause. Now it's time for me to disappear, and I'll be back with you in a moment for Q&A. And here's where you can get the slides, tbjones.com if you like, uh, or buy a book. Great. Well, thanks, Terry. I, I really appreciate it. I, I like the uh, the sort of the approach to innovation versus disruption. It's really, it would be innovation if you thought of it as opposed right. to it happening to you, so. Oh, it's a uh, disruption. Yeah, it's just because you didn't do it. <laughs> Great, well, cool. Well, thank you for that. Uh, for those, uh, we do have some questions already, but uh, if you are uh, watching online there, definitely put in some questions. We'll get those to Terry here. Uh, so first question, 
What industries do you see are adapting to disruption better than others? Well, I think the ones that were already big in e-commerce. So you've seen Amazon, Best Buy, even Walmart has terrific results. Um, the travel industry is the biggest part of e-commerce, but it's harder for other companies. Industrial companies, B2B companies still need to work much, much harder than they have. Obviously, restaurants are changing to delivery. Um, that's been a wrenching change. Uh, curbside delivery. I know Best Buy had an 18-month plan for curbside delivery. They did it in two days. You can't unlearn that. <laughs> so uh, I think the traditional guys who weren't doing e-commerce are having a tough time changing their business and becoming data-oriented. I'm working with a movie business who really doesn't know who their customers are. They have to change. And I'm curious with, with you coming from, you know, such a, an expert in the travel industry uh, with what, what's happening with travel right now. I mean, how would you recommend that companies in the travel industry adapt just because I know it's been affected so much? Well, if I'm making a video in an hour for somebody about that. Um, really, you know, they have to do touchless, contactless, safety, but they also have to tell the story better. Much of their stuff about how safe it is to fly today, and it's pretty safe now, is on their website. Nobody's going there. Mm. They have to really scrounge up the money to do some TV ads more than social media and tell the story about, because Delta, for example, has an amazing story about middle seats open and spraying planes and touchless check-in, but not enough people know it. Um, so it's going to be tough. I think leisure travel will come back first, business travel later. The one-day meeting is dead. And for all you meeting planners, virtual works. Uh, I've got some great reviews myself about virtual meetings. And I think every meeting going forward is going to be hybrid, virtual and physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right there with you. And we've, yeah, we've been doing, I think, a few hundred uh, virtual events just in a few months. So a lot of companies are adapting to that. Um, let's see, our next question. What internal issues uh, do leaders need to address in order to be better at change? Well, I think it comes from the leader. Um, the most important part is allowing experimentation and failure. And you have to kill projects not people, right? So if the people work on a project that fails and they don't get fired, they're gonna give you new ideas. But basically, until they learn there's a safety net, they will never change either. either. So it comes from the top. It's top down first to get bottom up later. If, if it's risk and then faster decisions, which ha happens a lot during COVID, a lot of the boards I'm on, we're making decisions way faster and not asking permission, we're asking forgiveness. So risk and faster decision making. All right, this next question is from Kathy Verisi. Uh, do you still see IoT serve, uh, devices, et cetera, increasing as fast as originally projected with so many Americans out of work and with some jobs not coming back? Yeah, I think they're disassociated because IoT allows companies to do more work even with fewer workers, unfortunately. So they're doing sensing, they're using drones. Uh, you saw the robotics coming in. I think IoT will continue unabated uh, as people have the capital resources. I mean, airlines aren't doing it because they have no money, but this is a lumpy recession. Software companies, manufacturing companies are still doing okay where travel companies are in a tank. So I think IoT will continue to move very, very quickly, particularly with 5G. Uh, what are ways you can teach your team to learn how to be better disruptors? Well, we talked about giving them risk. I think you have to listen better. Uh, we had a program at American or at Travelocity where you know, we really worked on listening to our employees because the best ideas come from the bottom. We started paging people when their flights were late in 1996. That idea came from a customer service agent who was tired of answering the phone. So if you listen, your people have the best ideas. You just have to foment that and say, we want them, we want them, and then celebrate them, reward them, and they'll do that, even virtually. I made a virtual speech last week, uh, a keynote, and then we did breakouts. They got 500 new ideas. By breaking people out, putting them into interesting groups and Zoom rooms, and fomenting those ideas. It can be done. Very cool, very cool. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, how, do you, how do you personally, uh, Terry, keep up with change? Well, I do a tremendous amount of reading. Uh, I've just written a new book on disruption that took a lot of reading and a lot of work on the internet. You can write a book just by reading the internet today. <laughs> um, and I'm reading blogs and articles, you know, whether it's McKinsey, Accenture. I'm on still on a lot of boards. I still invest in startups. You know, uh, people said I was crazy to do a startup at age 70. 
uh, did I have to do that? I said, no, I'm on Medicare. I don't have to do that. I'm old. <laughs> but I did it and it was a ball. That one didn't work. We ran out of money. But I've done five startups, four successful. Uh, maybe I'll do another. You just have to keep your hand in uh, and learning all the time and reading very broadly. I'm a curious guy. So, look, it's great to be with you virtually. Um, I want to say to all the planners, let's do virtual meetings. We can do them quickly. They cost a fraction of physical meetings and they do work. Great. Well, Terry, thank you again so much for sharing your message uh, on how the pandemic has forced disruption in your business and what's next.